and Professor Modot Hussein Rana, sir, who is uh, due to some unavoidable circumstances, uh, currently could not be present. So the session will be chaired by Professor Mohammad Rajal Karim, sir. And our speakers are Professor Shehan Williams, sir, from Sri Lanka, Prof uh, Sir Brigadier M. S. V. K. Raju from India, and Brigadier General Retired Professor Mohammad Ajizul Islam from Bangladesh. Let me introduce our uh, chair, Professor Mohammad Rajal Karim, sir. He is a former professor of psychiatry in Silet Women's Medical College Hospital, former principal and dean in medicine faculty in Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology, and he is the former president of Bangladesh Association of Psychiatrists. Before I hand over the session uh, to our chair, I would like to share the rules of the session to, with you. We have three presenters today. Each presenter will get 20 minutes, and the first bell uh, for the speakers will, ring, will be ring at 15 minutes, the second bell will be at 18 minutes, and the screen will be turned off at 20 minutes. Later that, uh, we will have 10 minutes for discussion. Now I'm requesting uh, Professor Mohammad Rajal Karim, sir, to come over the stage and taking the charge of the session. Thank you. Our first presenter is Professor Shehan Williams. Professor Shehan Williams is the Vice President of the Sark Psychiatric Federation. He is the past president of the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists and currently the chairman of the Board of Study for Postgraduate Training in Psychiatry in Sri Lanka. He is a professor in psychiatry at Faculty of Medicine, University of Kelania. Professor Shehan Williams, please come to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here in Chittagong today to uh, make this presentation. I'm deeply grateful to the Bangladesh Association of Psychiatrists for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to make this presentation. So I will be speaking on managing dementia effectively. I know when it comes to dementia, it's sometimes no man's land, we are neurologists, geriatricians, and so many people get involved. But I think the psychiatrist has the biggest role um, at the end of the day to support people with dementia. Now dementia, many of us consider to be a problem of the West, a problem of developed countries. But Research evidence clearly shows that dementia is an Asian problem. The majority of people with dementia, nearly 50% in time to come, will live and continue to live in the Asian part of the world. The prevalence of dementia, as you know, increases with age. And when our population ages and people age uh, or the percentage of people over 65 keep increasing in any given pop population, then we will have more and more people presenting to us with dementia. This September was World Alzheimer's Month, as you know, and the Alzheimer's societies globally mark or take this opportunity to raise awareness on dementia and the main cause of dementia, particularly related to age, which is Alzheimer's. And global estimates say that nearly 57 people are affected by Alzheimer's disease alone today. Now, as you know, as psychiatrists, 
we go back to the basics of assessing people with dementia and the mini mental state examination is something that's commonly used across cultures. It's a very basic screening tool which helps us and sometimes even getting people to do who are not very literate to just draw a clock or something like that helps us to eventually see the progression of this condition. Now dementia is a syndrome. It's not just memory problems alone. If it's only memory, we call it amnesia. But in dementia, there is much more than memory. There is multiple cognitive deficits associated with functional impairment in clear consciousness. And a change from a previous level, that is, some people may have learning disability from birth, but this is something where a person becomes much more impaired than usual and persisting for more than six months duration. In today's context, we also talk of this condition called mild cognitive impairment or MCI, which is when older people or people start complaining of memory issues. And when you do assess them, you do find that they have some memory problems, but only memory problems alone but they are able to still continue to function. Sometimes they may even be doctors and psychiatrists. They continue to practice, are able to do things, but find themselves to be more forgetful than usual. And when we test them also, we find that they have short-term memory impairment, but otherwise well-functional. And this is a group we call to be having mild cognitive impairment. And the main category when they have memory impairment is called amnestic MCI. Now, not everybody with this condition goes on to dementia or Alzheimer's disease. In fact, uh, only 10 to 15 percent progress to Alzheimer's disease every year. Some may even revert back to normal or continue at this state with monitoring. We may be able to keep them going as normal. Now, dementia is a broad category of conditions which cause this syndrome. The common causes are the degenerative causes, as we know, and they are not treatable as present. Alzheimer's disease, vascular or multi-infarct dementia, conditions like Pick's disease, Parkinson's disease, and also Huntington's disease. But we need to evaluate a person with dementia carefully because there are a small percentage of people who may be having treatable conditions, which initially used to be called reversible causes. Having tumors, subfrontal meningiomas, another common presentation would be normal pressure hydrocephalus, vitamin deficiencies, endocrine issues like Addison's, Cushing's, or hypothyroidism, Sometimes we need to think of HIV-related illnesses such as AIDS dementia complex and previously syphilis or neurosyphilis, tertiary syphilis was one of the main causes of dementia. Alcohol is another common cause of dementia leading even to the condition known as Korsakoff's and sometimes Wilson's disease and other chronic uh, drug intoxications. Now, dementia should always be, again, ideally evaluated by a psychiatrist because we know of depressive pseudo-dementia. People, older people, particularly with depression, present with memory issues and depressive symptoms. And treating the depression gets them better. So it's depressive pseudo-dementia that needs to be considered. This is where sometimes even neurologists may not be able to treat it properly. Now, the main cause of dementia that affects most people when they age is Alzheimer's disease. The diagnosis is made at post-mortem, but there are certain criteria that help us to make this diagnosis as probable Alzheimer's disease main, uh, based on certain criteria that has been laid down as here. So in definite Alzheimer's disease, it's a post-mortem diagnosis. We are based on intracellular neurofibrillary tangles and extracellular amyloid plaque. On histopathological 
what we call BRAC staging, people make the diagnosis of definitive Alzheimer's disease. Now, biochemical radiological diagnosis for dementia is still elusive, but there are studies where we do see a safe tau protein levels, but this is again not very specific for Alzheimer's disease alone and can occur in other kinds of dementia. Increasingly, we do neuroimaging now for people with dementia, and the classical symptom for Alzheimer's or classical sign in Alzheimer's disease is medial temporal lobe atrophy. You need to ask the radiologist to give a temporal lobe view to get this medial temporal lobe, where you see the atrophy of the medial temporal lobe, as shown here in this, uh, I'm sorry, the other picture has gone out, but you see that the medial temporal lobe, which is usually nicely filled up, goes down. And if you get a temporal lobe view, this is highly suggestive of Alzheimer's disease uh, if the person is presenting with dementia. Now, often missed is this condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, we are the, which is at post-mortem considered the second commonest cause of dementia, but the diagnostic criteria may not be very sensitive, so we miss this diagnosis sometimes, but dementia with Lewy body precedes Parkinson's disease, it is closely related to it, and patients are extremely neuroleptic sensitive and they present with visual hallucinations. You will find they will come and say vivid visual hallucination, seeing people in the evening, walking around uh, in the house or things like that. And we sometimes give them antipsychotics to control it and they become extremely neuroleptic sensitive and can even develop neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And these people respond sometimes well to acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like donapacil and therefore always suspecting dementia with Lewy bodies, particularly when they have fluctuating cognition. The cognition seems very early marked during the day, much better in the mornings but in the evenings they are more sort of confused. Recurrent visual hallucinations which are well formed and detailed, seeing people seated in the house, people participating in their meals or sitting with them, people playing in the garden. And then if you look carefully, you find that spontaneous features of Parkinsonism is there. And now REM sleep behavior dis disorder, if you ask the family members, they will say the person is very restless in their sleep, they move around all over, and sometimes the wife or husband says, I can't sleep next to them, they hit me in the night or kick me in the night, and things like that. Again very much is suggestive of dementia with Lewy bodies. Now in an ideal world setting, I don't know whether you have the facilities for PET imaging, that scan will give the diagnosis, which is very expensive and which is not used in our part of the world, where if you do the DAT scan, you will find the difference in people with dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, vascular dementia, again, is a common problem associated classically, as we know, in MCQs for medical residents, they are stepwise progressive associated with vascular risk factors. And in MRI brain, you would see white matter changes and micro infarcts. Deep white matter hyalination, highly suggestive of white vascular dementia and sometimes focal neurological sign. So all patients with dementia need to be investigated because of the treatable causes I mentioned and generally we would try to, particularly in younger people presenting with dementia, we would do most of these investigations to look for underlying causes. Now traditionally we used to talk of pre-senile versus senile using a cutoff of 65 years. Now this is not very significant because all of the conditions mentioned can occur both pre-senile as well as after age 65. So this distinction is not very important. Although in younger people, we will try to investigate a little bit more to find the underlying reason for the dementia. We also talk of cortical dementia and subcortical dementia. Again, cortical dementia is where we have the classic presentation with memory impairment, language difficulties, and so on. Subcortical, more sort of people becoming withdrawn, 
not involved in activities, very mentally slowed down with depressive symptoms and so on. Now what is the treatment? How do we manage a person with dementia? So we have three options. We can prevent, we can do symptomatic. Unfortunately, even now, globally, we don't have a cure for dementia or particularly Alzheimer's disease, the main cause of disease, yeah, and the disease modifying is at a trial stage. Now risk factors that we can prevent, unfortunately, are few. And uh, age, as I said, is the most important risk factor. As we age, we all run the risk. And if we all live till 90 years, maybe one in three of us are bound to develop this condition because the risk increases with age. So when we think of dementia, something that we need to be very worried about because it is maybe one day going to affect many of us. And people with family history, Down syndrome, the apolipoprotein E4 allele and autosomal dominant mutations are more prone. For residents, there are particularly for early onset Alzheimer's disease, three genes which are clearly identified. The APP gene on chromosome 21, chromosome 14 presenilin 2 and the chromosome 1 presenilin 1 and we know that all persons with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's disease early on because they have this extra chromosome 21 which is the amyloid precursor protein gene. So in top of Down syndrome they will become demented by age 40, 45, 50 so you will see a significant de decline in those with down syndrome. Right, ApoE4 allele is one of the other things that's sometimes done, but it's not a very useful test because up to 50% of people who have this allele also don't develop dementia, so you get worried, but you don't develop it even at 90 years. And sometimes even two-thirds of the people who develop Alzheimer's disease don't have this allele. So probable risk factors are depression, hypertension and vascular disease and all these things have to be controlled. Head injury, significant head injury can be a problem. Possible risk factors, female gender, unfortunately females are more affected by this condition, post probably post menopausal related. Low intelligence and education, smoking is a risk factor and B12 folate deficiency. The best evidence for preventing dementia is to keep ourselves physically and mentally active. If we, we need to keep working our mind and our bodies, we either we use it or we lose it. So this is something we have to do in our day-to-day uh, -day life. Treatment, symptomatic is what we have. We all know about cholinesterase inhibitors, very marginal improvement which have to weigh the risks versus the costs for the patient. Most of our patients are unable to afford it unless the uh, hospital is able to give it. It has very marginal benefits. Some people particularly will benefit, but not everybody benefits from it. And we know in moderate to severe de dementia, the evidence is for glutamate, uh, NMDA receptor antagonists like memantine, Again, small beneficial effects, particularly in reducing agitation and restlessness in patients. Now, what we mainly use most of the time because of behavioral and psychological symptoms are atypical antipsychotics, but they too have their risks. As you know, they increase the risk of strokes, and typical antipsychotics will cause Parkinson's symptoms and slow down people with dementia. This is modifying treatment. So many trials going on globally, as you know, both to reduce the tau production inside the tangles as well as prevent amyloid deposition in the neurotic plaques, which result in the neuronal death. And this is from last week or this week, where there is a lot of excitement about aducanumab and lecanumab, which reduce the amyloid burden in the brain but you have to give it intravenous. A lot of people develop brain edema when this is given very controversial drug. US appro has approved the trials in humans and it's still going on. And although rats, in rats the amyloid is reduced, the question is whether this reduction in amyloid will really 
we clinically uh, make a difference to the person where their memory will improve is the huge question that's going on. Highly expensive, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars for one treatment, which is given intravenous currently, but very exciting in the Western world today about reducing amyloid. So many clinical trials going on using various drugs that are there. But to us as psychiatrists, these are the problems. Patients come and complain to us. Behavioral issues, disturbance, this is what is affecting most of the people. So I will, because of the lack of time, keep this short. These are the challenges we face when we see our patients. Issues even like elder abuse, which is not uh, very uh, sometimes apparent. And we need to, in our parts of the world, look at the patient care. And it's everybody's business. We cannot, as psychiatrists, manage it alone. We need the help of the GP, perhaps even nurse field officers and the social services organizers support this. So Sri Lanka, this is a foundation uh, I head called the Lanka Alzheimer's Foundation. And we keep people active, keep awareness going, get young people to get involved with people with dementia and keep them uh, going on in what they do. And uh, also developing dementia-friendly communities because we need to work with people and helping each other in supporting people with dementia, which is a global pandemic. So thank you very much. I bring greetings from Sri Lanka to the wonderful nation of Bangladesh. Thank you for all your support during our economic crisis and difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shehan Williams, for your insightful presentation. Now, our second presenter is Professor Brigadier MSVK Raju. Before introducing him, I would like to uh, share another point with you. Uh, if you have any question, answer, a question, uh, due to time constraint, we cannot take it directly from the dais. We will provide you with the pen and paper. Please raise your hand if you have any question. Our uh, team will uh, reach you. Now, Professor MSVK Raju. He was professor and head of the Department of Psychiatry at Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, and two other private universities. He was president of Indian Psychiatric Society, president of Sark Psychiatric Federation, and the president of Association of Industrial Psychiatry of India. He was the board member of Asian Psychiatric Federation, board member and Zone 16 representative of the World Psychiatric Association. Professor Brigadier M. S. V. K. Raju, please welcome. Thank you, Madam, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, uh, I must thank Professor Wazir Chaudhary and the Bangladesh Psychiatric Association for giving me this opportunity to talk on the subject, which is not a very popular subject. You don't find anybody talking about dreams in any psychiatric conference. So thanks once again. <coughs> Well, dreams always mystified mankind, and this is the earliest description of dream 4,000 years ago in the Gilgamesh in present-day Iraq, and we all know the biblical story of Joseph interpreting the dream of Farwa, seven fat cows and seven lean cows. Well, these days we talk, discuss about sleep, how much one is sleeping, how less one is speaking, and so on. But we don't talk about the content of the sleep. Uh, and uh, dreams have become a vanishing species in psychiatry. None of the conferences, even in our Indian psychiatry conference or anywhere, world psychiatry, dream is not a subject among all the subjects. We don't talk about dreams. 
I don't know why, honestly. Uh, this is a painting from the Algiers, the women of Algiers by the celebrated Spanish painter Pablo Picasso. <coughs> what you see in the dream is a few breasts, small and big, thrown around, and a few buttocks here and there, and one leg is up, hands down, triangles and stripes. I do not know the meaning. I can't understand it. But I cannot understand. It doesn't mean there is no meaning in the painting. Those who understand, they value it high. So much so, an aficionado purchased this painting for a meager sum of $179.4 million. That is about 18.5 billion Bangladesh taka. <clears throat> that was in 2010. You can so just to start a brief, I will try to be brief as much as possible given the time. 20 minutes is not the time to talk dreams about. A couple brought their kid, 12 year old kid, who had ADHD and LD to me. Well, treated and boy improved. But a year later, the man comes alone with history of long standing generalized anxiety disorder. Treated with acetylopram plus something. I will not be talking about the other things which were treated. After two months, he reports excessive dreams and seems not to be worried about. He is a generalized anxiety patient. Excessive dreams. We know that the SSRIs produce excessive dreams. Many medicines produce more dreams, some medicines less dreams, and so on. So, but then I asked him to tell about his dreams. <coughs> In the dream, he said he could coax his college teacher to have sex with him, actually, in his car. He had other sexual experience also. This was when he was junior college. She was a teacher. He was infatuated with her, like most of us do in our younger days. So, and his wife, and we talked about one thing later, we discussed about things over time. And his wife, it revealed his wife, and he had been sleeping in separate rooms for the last eight years because they were afraid of producing another kid with the same problem. The education there, both of them were highly educated. So what do the, well, we all dream about 600 hours uh, in one year, and that amount about 41,000 hours in an average lifespan. And Homo sapiens, our species, is two lakh years old. In these two lakh years, dreams have not been weeded out of our system. We lost our tails because of no use, but dreams persisted. Natural selection is not abolished dreams. So obviously, dreams serve a purpose. One thing is the expression wishes, which cannot be otherwise be expressed. Virtual threat stimulation, we practice threat situation in our dreams so to adapt to the natural environment, influence the way one feels the next day. You had a bad dream the previous night, you will feel bad next day. You had a good dream, you will feel a little cheerful next day. Can regulate long-term moods, influence physiological states, reflect ongoing concerns and consistency aspects of person, that we'll be talking about content analysis, and consolidation of memory. And lastly, as Freud has said, dreams protect sleep because the dreams, you continue sleeping. Then what is a dream? Dream has become difficult to define these days, but simply put, all perceptions, thoughts, or emotions expressed during sleep is a dream. There are several dimensions to dreams, actually. The dynamics means why a dream occurs, the forces behind the occurrence of a dream, what makes a latent content in manifest content? Content analysis, what elements are there in the dream? That is the content. Typical dreams, certain dreams, all universally, all people all over the world have some common dream elements. Neuroscience of dreams, dreams in medical conditions, dreams in psychotic disorders, dreams in medicines, dream therapy, lucid dream therapy is, possible, is popular now, dream engineering, you can manipulate dreams by technology, Telepathy and precognition. Telepathy is dreaming something which can happen at the same time somewhere else. And precognition, dreaming something which is going to happen, not yet happened. Well, this is 
the man who started the scientific investigation of dreams, big man, and I was there at his place in Vienna some years ago, and you see Freud's ghost on my shoulder. No mystery in that, actually. Dream dynamics. What instigates dream is a wish, some wish, and you cannot fulfill that wish in real life. So the fulfillment of the wish is also depicted in the dream in a hallucinatory form. We can use dream in analysis like any other communication. That's what Freud said. The ILPA, which is quoted in the reference, is Introductory Lectures to Psychoanalysis. The NILPA is uh, a new Introductory Lectures to Psychoanalysis, and TID is the Introduction to Dreams. He's a monumental and acknowledged masterpiece. So, Freud said, and I quote here, we have never put forward such a thesis that all dreams are of sexual nature. Not at all. Actually, if you understand dreams, is not sex, all is not sex. There is a bit of sex everywhere, like in real life. We cannot interpret all dreams, Freud said, because of the resistance, because certain things we don't want to know. We don't want others to know. A few examples once again. Two naked kids, their bodies are wet, are running down a hill slope. Their bodies are saluted against the cut surface of two huge yellow boulders, boulders, big stones. The second dream is a person saw a beggar woman scrounging for food from discarded patal. Patal is you know, broad leaves stitched together in which we eat. Patal is an empty marriage shamiana. These are the two dreams. To understand dream, to interpret dream, to analyze the dream, you need to know the context in which the dream has occurred. One, two is you need to allow the patient to associate to each element of the dream. Like in the first dream, naked kids, <coughs> boulders, and running down the hill slope. And second is beggar woman, scrounging for food of patals and empty shamiana. Now, this is a person, the context is person who has suffered a myocardial infarction. He was in the coronary care unit, tube from coming from the nose, and uh, <coughs> pulse oximeter leads from the chest, and uh, he was lying prone on the bed for hours, and the monitor was doing blip, blip, ping, ping, ping noises, monotonous, he was all alone there, obviously, coronary care unit. So in that, but most distressingly, he craved for a little drop of water on his tongue and a bit of food in his stomach. It's all IV drip only. And add to that, his back ached like hell because he was lying in the same position in the bed for hours. We all doctors need to be patients at one time to understand what the patients undergo. Well, so in that distress, he could drifted into a fitful sleep in which he had these two dreams. And he interpreted his dreams. One of the two kids was he himself when he was about 10 years old, and the other one is childhood friend. They would run down the hill slope, plunge into the village pond, and have fun. And the big borders are, in fact, potatoes, cut potatoes in a potato curry, which he used to enjoy as a kid. You understand now the meaning of the dream? Food, movement, he was bed there, wished to be move around and have fun, a company, a pleasant company, a boyhood friend, and all that. He could not do it. If he ran out of the bed, he would have died. Second, beggar woman scrounging for food. This is the actual scene which he had seen when he was young again. He was looking at the scene from the top of the head of the stairs. There's a shamiana empty, the marriage was just over, and patals were left over, were discarded there, and the beggar man was scrounging for food from there. Again, food. But most importantly is that at that time, he remembered in his associations, his childhood sweetheart was there beside him. A company, food, again some wish which could not be fulfilled otherwise. He had all these dreams. He could interpret his dreams because he himself was a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist happened to be yours truly. 
This was me, I had this dream in 89, January 19. So dreams, where is sex in these dreams? There is a wish of different kind. Where here is something little, we can interpret a little bit of sex. One of my colleagues had dream of black mangoes, he was distressed. Repeatedly he was getting dreams of black mangoes. Well, black mangoes, I have not seen actually. Black mangoes, it so happened. Then mangoes and black, these are elements they have to be associated with. Then he remembered he was, when he was in the junior college, he was studying and evening he would go on the mango orchard and read under the mango tree with fruits or hanging. We could not pluck them because the watchman was there. And second association was, in his youth, some dark girl gracefully allowed him to touch her breast, not more. He remembered that. But why now he had this gene? Because at one time it so happened, his colleague's daughter had a malfunctioning wardrobe, as they call it now. He could see an exposed breast. He felt like touching that breast, which he did not like. So this dream came into his. So this, you can say perhaps a little bit of sex is there. This is about the forces which determine a dream. And you have to interpret and integrate into his personality. And the other is, what is the dream? What elements are there in dream? These are the founders of the content analysis, Calvin Hall, Robert Van der Kassel, and William Domoff. They devised a method in content analysis. Content analysis is the person may not be there before you. He sends a dream report, he or she, and you analyze them and give each element a alphanumerical figure so that you can compute the percentages and proportions and numbers and subject to the dream report to statistical analysis. So this is a quantitative analysis, not like psychodynamics. And you have, if the dream reports are less than 75, they're called small series, more than 75, long series. People have, Domov had thousands of dream reports. Fundamental tenets is continuity and consistency. Continuity means your dream is a carry of your wake life. Your continuous, your waking life continues into the dream. And consistency is you dream the same element more or less over long periods of life. These are the two fundamental tenets. These dreams are categorized, contains into 10 categories, characters, social interactions, activities, striving, and so on, all these elements. I have to rush through these things because of the time. But there are 10 categories. Each of these categories are quantified in alpha numerical numbers. They are computed together, and they are compared to the norms, and statistical significance is found. Say, an example of sample coding, characters. Wahida Rahman is an actress. She is my favorite for long many years. I think she is the actress as far as I'm concerned. Wahida Rahman is an actress. She is one, so one number is there. She is woman, so F. Her profession, she is an actress, is a profession, so occupation is O, and she is an adult, so one F O A. Now, second example, he killed the rat. He is a man, so one male, unknown, who is he, we don't know. Adult, kill, A8 is aggression, eight category. Killing is the highest form of aggression against one animal. Like that, they are computed. Abdul Javed and Gautam Saha reached Chittagong by air. So, <laughs> Abdul Javed, this should be one, one male. And prominent figure, Abdul Javed, the president of the World Psychiatric Association, adult. Similarly, Gautam Saha, one MPA should be. And their location changed, L. By other means of transport. If they walk down to Chittagong, the L would be M. Like that. Everything is that the Professor Vazul Chaudhary won a lottery. Yesterday, he was distributing lotteries. So, lottery is good fortune to GF. So, Vazul Chaudhary is one male, prominent person, president of Bangladesh Psychiatric Association, adult. Like that. All these categories are computed and together. This is a short dream series of mine, just to show how you go about in coming day. Say, human characters are 
This is the norm, this is the study. The human characters are 97% in this study. Same almost, no change. Male characters are 52% and female are 48% in this sample. The norm is 48 and 52 for females, for women. For men, it is male people dream males. Unlike popular perception, male people, the norm is 67% of the males dream male figures and 33% female figures. So from this we can know the dreamer is probably a female, a woman. And you see that she is significantly high familiar elements, prominent figures, aggression, dreamer as aggression, she is the aggressor, not the other way around, usually the other way around. Verbal aggression, stealing and destruction, she has difficulty in befriending people. Injury, she has some illness, very highly illness elements are there, prominent. She is not happy, not happy or she's, as usual, normal, no different, but she's significantly sad. She's angry, no anxiety. She is in familiar settings. She likes to wear cloth, she likes to have food, and she likes colors. This is the blind analysis. If you do that, this is the pen picture I got. She lives surrounded by familiar people in familiar settings. She is married, she referred to her husband in two or three reports. No prominent persons which we have seen. Loves to eat, probably overweight, verbally aggressive and destructive. She used to bite her mother. Has difficulty in making and destroy things at the slightest pretext. Difficulty in making friends. Love to wear colorful clothes and personal effects. Is physically or mentally ill. Feels angry and sad, but is not apprehensive. Now this is a person subsequently, I saw her. She's a bottle and personality with prominent social anxiety. So, but one thing is that she's not married. She was showing in the dream she's married. She knows no prominent person. Now that is the bridge between content analysis and psychodynamics. Why she's showing you as married, dreaming as married when she's not married? You see, now, so you have to take all things together to understand the dream. That's the point which I want to make. Here, this dream series, as I said, you see, this is the Jason series of Damoff. Over a period of 17 years, she collected 600 dreams and divided them into 100 each. You see the male-female proportion almost same over a period of 17 years. Reflection of the personality, consistency. In my small sample, you can see that 28 uh, dream series, the male-female same. There is a part of one year difference is there between the two sides. Now specifics to common. Now we have talked about how dreams occur, what are the forces and what are the elements in a dream. Now as I said, certain elements all over the world people dream same elements. Like say flying, seeing snakes, falling bridges, falling tooth and so on. So Typical dreams are recurrent in nature, demonstrate little variation in content and shared by many people. This study we did in Bhopal, you can see the pattern of items, there are about 55 items, like I said, snakes and flying and eating food, wearing clothes and so on, failing examination, appearing in a classroom, seeing dead bodies, dead body coming alive, seeing God, Something? Some who, yeah? Twenty minutes, okay. Can I take two more minutes, four minutes? Okay. I seek the indulgence of the chair, and we are sitting little time. But anyway, we have compared our figure with the Kennedy students. Again, you see the same pattern, more or less, this thing is there. We see more snakes, probably they see less. They see have more sexual items than us. So there are commonalities otherwise broadly. These are the third revolution of the neuroscience. The Asterinsky found REM sleep in 53 thereafter. Mark Holmes said, uh, Juvet said REM sleep generated in the ponds. That's why the dreams are created. 
Mars home from South Africa said REM and dreams are two different things. When pons is damaged, still people dream. When, but when the prefrontal lobes are separated by frontal lobotomy or you are right, paratoxidal junction is damaged, you don't dream. So there are different areas in REM sleep. These are the things we have done. Prefrontal cortex is hypoactive, same way your posterior cingulate gyrus and all, so that when you dream, you are not aware, you are conscious, you think as real, reality testing is impaired when you are actually, but in lucid dreams, your reality testing is intact. When you are dream, you are aware you are dreaming, you can manipulate the content of the dream. And that is taken as a form of therapy to make people feel better, as I said. When you have a good dream, you feel better. So you can, you can many people, are not lucid dreamers, only 23% dream once in a month lucid dream and 50% in a lifetime. I am a lucid dreamer. But the good thing is that people can be trained to dream lucid and they can manipulate their dream in their dream so that they could feel better when they are awake. Like that they can be treated for nightmares and, and phobias and all that. And also you can be trained to have lucid dreams by giving galantamine or electrical stimulus, direct current, or alternate current, and so on. You see, this the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is hyperactive, so that your reality testing is not impaired. You know that you are dreaming. Now their technology is coming in a big way into dreams, dream speech, dream images, dream movements are reconstructed by technology, or there in the process, probably in the next decade or so, we will be able to see our dreams live a little later. And we can see live, others also can see live, that can create ethical problems. And just a bit of surreality. This is Abraham Lincoln. He was shot dead when he was watching a dream. The thing is that two days before he was shot dead, he discovered the entire scene, the assassination scene, to his biographer fully. So he knew well before that he was in the dream that he was going to be shot dead. That is precognition. Now we cannot explain now what is surreal today is real tomorrow. We all know that. We may find why it happened and how it can happen. Second is the big subject, raising from philosophy, physical sciences, medicine, psychology, biology, and clinical psychiatry, and dreams. Only when we have all these things, we will understand the subject psychiatry fully well. Okay, I'll just last line. Ignoring dreams will erect walls between us and our minds. We spend one third of our life in sleep and dreams. Ignoring dreams will erect walls between our minds and the minds of our patients. We can break the walls by looking at our own dreams. That's the big advantage we have. We can look into our own dreams. Very revealing. And we can break the walls by looking at the dreams of our patients. As a first step, ask your patient about their dreams. That is the carry home message, if at all. And this lecture, if it has made some people think of dreams, I think the purpose will be well served. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you, Professor M.S.V.K. Raju, uh, for your elaborated and nice presentation. Now it's time for third presentation, and this uh, presentation will be presented by Professor Brigadier General Retired Dr. Mohammad Azizul Islam, who is a professor of psychiatry and currently principal of U.S. Bangla Medical College Hospital, Narayan Ganj, Bangladesh. He is the vice president of Bangladesh Association of Psychiatrists, general secretary of faculty of psychiatry, Bangladesh College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Vice President of Mental Health Foundation in Bangladesh. Please welcome Professor Brigadier General uh, Dr. Mohammad Azizul Islam, sir.
Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Redwana Hussain, for the introduction. Uh, one small thing to say, Redwana Hussain is one of the promising star in the field of psychiatry, the young star in the field of psychiatry. And there is a very good book, Case-Based Learning Exercise in Psychiatry. She is the co-author of this book with Professor M.S. A. Monique, a very good book for the psychiatrist here in the student for the country. Respected chairperson of today's session, Professor Rajal Kurim, another, I'll say, giant in the field of psychiatry. Professor Rajal Kurim is the first fellow in the psychiatry in Bangladesh. And that's our pleasure and honor, sir, to be here. We are really grateful to you for being uh, with us. And after the two great men, I'm a small man with a small presentation. In front of us, there are also great peoples, the leaders in the field of psychiatry, the professors, my seniors, and my colleagues and students. The subject mental health care in today's world, challenges and preventive strategies. Actually, this is the theme of this uh, ICP, International Con Conference on Psychiatry. This is the theme. Why I have said I'm too small to speak about it? Because I know everyone is concerned about it. Everyone knows what are the challenges in the field of psychiatry and what the preventive strategies will be. But what I had been feeling, there should be a small presentation on it to, I mean, to stimulate you about the issue, the problem that we are, we are facing every day in our country and throughout the world. As you all know, mental health care refers to services devoted to the treatment of mental disorders and the improvement of mental health in people with mental disorder or problems. But what I feel that I do not want to keep it within the framework of this mental disorder and problem. The people with mental disorder problem, I don't want to keep it within this framework. What I feel that this mental health care should be, the definition should be extended for the whole people, for the total, gen total population, not for the only mental health, uh, ill patient or mental disorder patient. Because our aim is to work for the people of the country, for the people, entire people of the globe, not for the only the mental disorder of what we are telling. And as, if we go through the burden of the mental disorder, we found that one of five of the people, person, experience a significant episode of mental illness during their lifetimes. That is very important. That is one in five. If we see it here, one in five can have mental disorder in our lifetime. So a huge number, a huge number of people are in question. And if you see the percentage increase in estimated case of mental disorder between 1990 and 2019 is 48%. That is, it is the increase rate. 48% increases by this time period. And neuropsychiatric disorder, the second greatest cause of burden after the cardiovascular disease in respect of the disability adjusted life years. Possibly this is another issue what we want to know, what we actually really are not aware that disability adjusted life years in our country especially. We don't care about it, we do not know about it really. And psychiatric disorders account for 40% of the chronic diseases. These are the very important points why we are working on it and what is the requirement of the, what are the challenges and preventive strategies, why it is required. This burden of mental disorders depicts the picture actually. So the challenges, what are the challenges in mental health care in today's world? As I have said it, everyone knows all this, it is just a stimulating and giving a stimulus to you to work on it. 
The first and foremost challenge, what I feel, is the stigma and discrimination. And this stigma is throughout the world. The stigma is within ourselves, stigma within the people, stigma within the rich, within the poor, educated, non-educated, religious, non-religious, and whatnot. The stigma is the main cause of obstruction, main, main challenges for us to work in the field of mental health. And what we observe, the more the literate, the more is the stigma. The more the literate, the more we hide the things. The more the literate, we don't want to express that we have some mental health issues or our children or our family members have a mental health issue. That is the more challenging one. And stigma is the, what I am telling, the main cause of discriminations and exclusions. And because of the discrimination and exclusions, people have low self-esteem, deserves family relationship, and they are responsible for human right abuses. An individual having a mental disease, chronic mental disorder, is abused in the society, abused in the community, abused in the family even. Even very near and dear one always abuse individuals. That is a very important issue to know and to address with. And uh, it limits this discrimination exclusion, limits the ability to socialize and get housing and job even in our society. Every day we are facing that. I had some problem with depression or had a problem in the stress management and so the job has lost. This is every day picture everywhere you, you will find. Another important challenge is the inadequacy of the service. In our country and in other countries also, in the developing or developed country, there are a number of psychiatrists, nurses, sociologists, psychiatric social workers are very inadequate to meet the challenges. And the bed numbers are very insufficient in our country also. And in some countries, over 50% of the all patients are treated in the large mental hospital. But the present trend is to treat the person with the disorder in the community. But here you find that the most of the people are treated in the large hospitals. And lack of integration, there is no integration between the primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. We don't have a comprehensive plan to work with even. Cost and financing is another important challenge. And mental health disorders cost national economic billions of dollars in time of expenditure and loss of productivity. This is another issue, loss of productivity. We do not know what is the loss of productivity and why it is required. If we would know it, we would not sit in the, uh, in the traffic for hours together. And people do not understand what is the loss of productivity. And so they don't take care of the mental health problem or mental health issues. This is another important. And countries exp expense as low as 0.1% to as high as 6% of the health budget. In our country, it is just 0.44%. That is below 0.5% of the health budget. What a, a picture it is. What a uh, picture it depicts from the uh, higher authority, from the uh, government or other institutions. They don't feel even. There is very less empowerment in case of those who are suffering from the mental illness or those who are working on the mental health side. We don't have any empowerment really. So we cannot raise that much of the boys. Why? That also causes the discriminations. That also is attached to the stigma. That also lowers the self-esteem. So we even don't talk about it. We are not empowered with it. That are the, another important issue of the challenge that we are facing. The treatment gap in case of mental health throughout the world is very wide and 90% of the people with mental disorder do not receive proper care. And only 2.5% see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. What a strange picture it is. And in our country also, 94% in general population, in the adult psychiatry, and the child psychiatry is possibly 92% that treatment gap. That a huge number of the people, a huge, almost every people, what I'll say, are not going to a psychiatrist or mental health services for their illness. Even in developed countries, it is 44 to 70%. 
We don't have lack of promotional activities. Lack of promotional and preventive activities leads to enormous health and social burdens. That also the questions of discrimination and marginalization comes. And their causes reduce social cohesion and negative economic effects. Majority of the countries have not enough links to mobilize support from the government. That is, psychiatrists remain isolated. Trend has been, is going to change, but even earlier we saw that people in the field of psychiatry had less cohesion and cooperation with other peoples. They used to remain separate. Many of the psychiatrists still, if you look towards the hall now, you will find what is the cohesion and cooperation and support. So this is the things to note. This we should think why we cannot raise our voice, why the promotional activities are less, why it is going on. These are the challenges we need to face. So there are many more challenges, you know all. Now we can go for a short description about the how we meet the challenge. What are the preventive strategies? And you all know that prevention includes a wide range of activities aimed at reducing risk or threat to health. And from the public health perspective, the prevention is primary, secondary, and tertiary. You know, the primary prevention is you need to uh, work before the disease comes. So you need to work in the grassroots level with the people, bringing awareness of the peoples. And what is important is that many of the neurodevelopment disorder, you know, the autism or the other neurodevelopment disorders, uh, comes from the very antenatal care, the difficulties or the problems in the antenatal care or postnatal care or perinatal care. So care of the pregnant mother is another, one of the important issues in the primary preventive strategies. The vaccination is another issue, treatment of the nutritional deficiencies, and poverty reduction, better schooling, drug control, all this comes in the primary prevention, which many of, the, of these activities are not uh, uh, controlled by the psychiatrist or the stakeholders. These are the policy systems, these are the policy matters, these are matters with the governments. But we need to address all these issues because we are one of the most important stakeholders in the field. The secondary prevention strategy may be early detection of the depression through screening, motivational interviewing for smoking or substance use, and screening for suicidal ideation. We can go for all this because you all know the secondary prevention is to identify the risk people and working on them. And tertiary prevention includes the treatment of the mental disorders patient, occupational therapy and relapse prevention. All these includes in the tertiary prevention strategies. And there are other ways to prevent. That is, the, there may be Universal preventive strategies for all, selective preventive strategies, and indicative st preventive strategies. Universal preventive strategy is very important. Actually, th this is the point where you need to bring awareness to the people. If you cannot go universally to all, probably you cannot gain many things. To gain, to work on, and to really prevent, you have to bring awareness. You have to build the awareness with the people. You have to go to the corners. You have to go to the people into the village. You have to teach the imams, the religious teachers, the school teachers. You have to go to the classes. There should be a policy. <coughs> and the media can play a very important role. Media is very strong now in our country also. Rather, I will say in our country it is more stronger because everybody is if you look, everyone is looking some media, social medias. So media can make a change. So we have to work on it also in the prevention strategy of the mental health, mental disorders. The drug control, it is what I am telling, it is not only the psychiatrist or the stakeholders to work. It is the government policy, national policy, how it will be working. It is the policy to work in the colleges, in the universities. So these are the universal preventive strategies you need to work. There are the selective preventive strategies like the, the group, group therapy or parenting skill training, another field to know. Because the 
what we heard earlier that 75 percent 50 percent to 75 percent of the psychiatric illness starts before 25 years and 50 percent of the mental disorder starts before 15 years so these are the place where we need to work so we have to have the parenting skill training this should be addressed by everyone in every level these are the another selective preventive strategies and the indicative preventive strategies also you have to work suicidal screening and depression etc so effective promotional measures can be school based skill building program parenting training early screening for mental disorders workplace improvement taxation of the on the tobacco and alcohol guidelines for the media social policies to promote inclusions and physical activities all these can help as the effective promotional measures in the prevention and despite their effectiveness found in developed countries low and middle income countries face challenges in implementing them advocacy resource and talent sharing and global cooperation will help us to reemerge in our future together this uh, last lines are for the friends they, those who has come all along from different countries to bangladesh this is sharing talent sharing this is very important in the prevention or in the to meet the challenges for the today's mental health and uh, i want to thank is there dr dr asan aziz dr asan aziz Please look towards right side. He is Dr. Asan Aziz. Ah, very. You come forward. Another very important and talents uh, in the field of psychiatry. Very rising and promising. He is working in the research field. He is working with the all the uh, as the Dr. Uh, Tarek said yesterday in all the uh, uh, guidelines preparations. He has been working, and I am grateful to him because he has prepared these slides also. Thank you, Asan. So thank you all uh, for patience sharing. I'm too small to speak on the subject, but I try to just stimulate you. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Brigadier General, Professor Mohammed Ajizul Islam, sir for your concise uh, uh, presentation. Uh, now, uh, due to time constraint, we cannot take the question and answer, so discussion session has to be postponed. Now, I will request Professor Mohammed Rajal Korim, sir, to hand over the crest to our respected speakers. Sir, sir, uh, please, sir, can you hand mic give him a second? Sir, would you share your valuable comments before uh, this person? Uh, yes, sir. Regarding presentation, your valuable comments, please. Thank you, sir. Welcome you all for the first plenary session. Uh, as a routine rule, I have to talk about the little bit about the speakers and their topics. The first of all, this is Professor Shian William, who talked about the current evidence to manage dementia effectively. It's a challenge of right now for psychiatrists and the neurologist. So this is the one disease where we linked with the neurologist. This is a bridge between psychiatrist and neurologist. So we have a great part in the management of dementia. And you know that the age is increasing in Asian countries too. And is the, probably the highest in the Japan. And in Southeast Asia, the age is increasing. And as age is increasing, the, our dementia rate is also increasing. So we need a separate 
intuitive in geriatric psychiatric service, which we don't have. Probably in future, we have to think about the geriatric psychiatric service separately in our country. So I thank uh, Professor Shian William for his nice presentation. And second one is Brigadier, Professor Brigadier M. S. K. V. Raju. Uh, he talked about the dream, the few reflection dream. Yes, this dream is not a disease at all, but it's, it's a content of many diseases. So dream is usually less talked in psychiatry, but more talked in psychology. Anyway, this part is uh, not very fully understood by psychiatrists, but he actually explained in such a way and categorized the dream so that we can actually uh, categorize dream in different way and reflect the dream and, and it correlate with, with our diseases. But you know this in our country, some of the some of the aspects of dream is in the religious aspects that they think that it is the future they can predict the future by dream anyway i'm not talking about this part that part the last speaker professor brigadier general dr mohammad azizul islam he talked about the mental health care in today's world challenge and preventive status this is the most important part of this uh, session and most important for all psychiatrists in currently because as you know that psychiatry has a separate entity mental health and general health so mental health was neglected for long especially in our countries in Southeast Asia countries now it's become a challenge for us for the to uh, show the government that it is a real problem and we need a more budget for these people because we are very much worried about the mortality not the morbidity where the mortality is high our government our planners do better to actually they influence more in the mortality sectors like heart disease other diseases are like this but in psychiatry mortality is low so they don't care they are more uh, so we have to uh, we have to reflect that the productivity low productivity is very important and we lose a lot of billions of Takas and in, in, in terms of dollars. So these people should be treated effectively. And of course, I, I can mention here one thing that we need manpower too. Because right, right now, when I was in the, I was passed out, it was only three psychiatrists from passed out from the country and six psychiatrists from abroad. So there was nine psychiatrists totally in 1982 and now yesterday we have seen that there are 400 psychiatrists in Bangladesh so this is a good sign that 400 psychiatrists can push the government to have the enhance the mental health service in the country so with these viewers I thank all the speakers and especially our report here Dr. Rizwana for her nice introduction. Thank you, thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I'm requesting Professor Sheehan Williams to come over the stage and take his crest from our chair. Sir. Now, Professor M.S.V.K. Raju uh, from India, sir.
please uh, come on the stage. Professor uh, Brigadier General uh, Professor Mohammad Ajudul Islam Sir, uh, please come on the stage. Now, so Shihan Sir, Shihan Sir, a good question. And uh, this is the time for uh, crest giving to our respected chair. I will request Professor Dr. Wazil Alam sir to come on the stage and hand over the crest to our chair, Professor Mohammad Rajal Karim sir. Krista, sir, Krista, Krista, sir, uh, Professor Wazir Alam, sir, please uh, kindly hand over the crest to our chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, our chair, and thank you all the presenters uh, for your enthusiastic and insightful presentation. And I would also like to uh, thank Sinovia Pharma, who has sponsored the first plenary session of our day two of 11th ICP and third. 13th uh, Sark Psychiatry Conference. Uh, big hand for Sanovia Pharma. It's time for second session. Thank you all. Please be seated, Nadia. Uh, Please be seated, uh, all the audience. Good morning. Please be seated, our audience. Our second plenary session will be held very shortly. Please take your seat. I'm going to 
Ben de pek de diyor bu. Very good morning. Very good morning from the city of pride and beauty, Chittagong. I am Dr. Nadia Afros, Psychiatry, National Institute of Mental Health. Welcome to you all. Today's plenary session two, an 11th International Conference of Psychiatry and third SARC International Psychiatry Conference. Today, this plenary session will be chaired by our respected Professor Mohammad Farooq Alamsar and Professor Nirmal Lamichane. Please welcome Professor Farooq Alamsar and Professor Nirmal Lamichane to the dais and to take their seat. Thank you, sir. Professor Mohammad Farooq Alunsar is the professor and head of department of psychiatry of Popular Medical College, Dhaka. He is the former director and professor of National Institute of Mental Health and Hospital, Dhaka. He is the former president of Bangladesh Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Our second chairperson, Professor Nirmal Lamichane, is the head of department neuropsychiatry Gandaki Medical College Teaching Hospital and Research Center, Pokhara, Nepal, and Consultant and Fish Hale Hospital and Research Center, Gera Patan, Pokhara, and BG Hospital and Research Center, Chok, Maid Pane, Pokhara. He is currently serving as the General Secretary of Sark Psychiatric Federation. Today we have three presenters. Professor Chandra Prashad Sadein from Nepal and Professor Abdullah Mamun Hussain Sar from Bangladesh and Professor Pranav Kumar Dalal from India. Due to some unavoidable circumstances, Professor Pranav Kumar Dalal Sir could not able to reach here. Our first <coughs> presenter, Professor Chandra Kumar Prashad Sadein is the president of Psychiatrist Association of Nepal and is currently working as professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Chetan Medical College, Bharatpur Chetan, Nepal. Before starting the session, I would like to briefly discuss about the, some rules and regulation of the plenary session. Each participant will get 20 minutes for presentation. The first bell will ring at 15th minute, and the second will at 18 minute, and the screen will be closed at 20 minute. We are requested our dear participant to write down their question at given pen and papers, and we will collect at, at the session, at the end of the session. Now I, I would like to request Professor Pranav Kumar, Professor Chandra Kumar Sedan sir, to come on the dais and start his presentation. Professor, please, please sir. sir. Professor Chandra Kumar Sedin, sir.
respected uh, chairperson and uh, uh, all person on the hall. Very good morning. <coughs> uh, I am discussing about lithium. Uh, well known mood stabilizer. We are psychiatrists and uh, we are using uh, so many uh, prescriptions on our day. And uh, neurotropic and neuroprotective benefit. What is neurotropic function? So, <coughs> lithium gives uh, <coughs> protection to the neuron. And neuroprotective function is it gives the protection to the neuron. We know it is mood stabilizer. Now, so many research on the lithium. Uh, we know lithium uh, atom number three, atom number seven on the periodic table. It is the earliest mood stabilizer. And uh, 19, uh, 18, uh, 17, our person used initially treatment of gout. And uh, 1949, zone kit uh, discovered as it is used on the bipolar disorder, mood stabilizer. So it is cheapest mood stabilizer. Very good for poor people because patients have to take medicine long time. Sometimes five years, sometimes ten years, like that. About three to four times cheaper than sodium valerate. Uh, similarly, on the other hand, it is dangerous drug. If dose is high or lithium level is high, it is fatal sometimes. <clears throat> so, there are so many uses of lithium, we know. Uh, acute mania, bipolar disorder, severe affective disorder, Depression also, cyclothymia, impulse control disorder, lil Levin syndrome, schizophrenia, ADSD, eating disorder, contact line. Mood disorder and mood symptoms. Other very important thing regarding lithium is it is anti-suicide drug. It reduces the suicide. <coughs> Pharmacokinetics, lithium is rapidly <coughs> absorbed after oral administration. Peak serum level occur 33 hours. Completely absorbed in, uh, within 8 hours. And uh, <coughs> there is uh, some relation with the sodium. If sodium level is dropped, lithium level is high. So toxicity, chance of toxicity is more. So we can see here how tubular handling of lithium. Lithium is not protein bound and 70 to 80 percent reabsorb for example, convertible. So we can see on the chart. <coughs> mechanism of action of lithium. There is no single mechanism of action. More than one mechanism of action. Lithium effect NAK ATPs and accumulate intercellularly as a substitute of sodium. Lithium inhibit GSK3. 
GSA3B due to his increased activity of aptosis, programmed cell death, synaptic plasticity, neuroplasticity, cellular resilience, neuroprotection. Chronic lithium use cause increased brain neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And lithium is antioxidant. Lithium modulate dopamine, glutamate GABA, and other neurotransmitters. Lithium improve circadian rhythm and activate HPA axis. And it stabilizes the cell membrane along with the calcium and magnesium. <coughs> Lithium has a neurotropic and neuroprotective function. <coughs> there is a specific mechanism of action. So, lithium inhibit GSK3B. Uh, lithium various effect on the neurotropic factor, neurotransmitter, oxidative metabolism, aptosis, neuronal <coughs> structure and glial secondary messenger sy system, biological symptom, <coughs> and also it maintains the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, all suggest to underline the lithium's therapeutic effects. Other important brain uh, derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, is well known for the improvement of the neuronal maturation and differentiation, survival, synaptic plasticity, and long-term memory consolidation, and highly expressed in the cerebral cortex and hippocampus. <coughs> Lithium's numerous mechanism of action, including inhibition of the GSK-3B hive, have been also suggested to contribute to lithium's anti-suicidal properties. <coughs> What happened on the brain of long-standing bipolar disorder? It is reported that prefrontal cortex decreased volume of the prefrontal cortex, decreased volume of the anterior cingulate cortex, and increased lateral ventricle, and reduction of the white matter. So, uh, <coughs> Reduction of the gray matter, reduction of the white matter is there. Long standing bipolar disorder. Not only bipolar, schizophrenia also. So, lithium improved that function. Lithium counteracts that function. So, we can see in the picture uh, <coughs> area acid is the cognitive control. Prefrontal cortex, amygdala, hippocampus, like this. There is uh, healthy and long term bipolar disorders. So, how lithium work? Lithium work on the three levels. One is on brain structure, other is neurotransmitter level, other is intercellular level. <coughs> so lithium, uh, long-term lithium use improved brain structure. So it restored the brain structure. Uh, bipolar patients who were treated with uh, showed significantly greater gray matter density. So it, it improved the gray matter density compared with the healthy control. Similarly, daily doses of lithium treatment was positively correlated with the superior temporal guidance. Uh, it was studied under 2017. Uh, in patients with bipolar depression, long-term lithium treatment was associated with increased gray matter volume, including prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, anterior singular cortex, superior temporal cortex, 
and Vyasal Gyanali. It was uh, <coughs> 2010 study. So we can see on the picture, there is improved um, gray matter and white matter, different structure on the brain. So other work of lithium is lithium uh, <coughs> neurotransmitter level. Lithium inhibit dopamine and glutamine. And lithium promote the GABA neurotransmitter. So it works as the neuromodulation. Other cellular level, lithium inhibit the <coughs> protein kinase C, GSK3, and uh, <coughs> uh, BNDF and other, uh, you can see on the So there are so many studies. Uh, there is possible use of lithium on neurological disorder, apart from bipolar disorder, <coughs> like head injury, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and other conditions. Uh, it was a study of 2018. Other <coughs> lithium in the treatment of bipolar disorder through neuro, neuroprotective and neurotrophic mechanism. So again, <coughs> direct inhibition of the GSK3B. It was studied under 2017. Similarly, another article: lithium stress resilience in bipolar disorder. Neuroprotection and activation of plasticity pathway in lithium's clinical response. One of the studies, um, 2016, long term lithium treatment engages intercellular and extracellular brain neurotrophic factors. Uh, BDNF in cortical and hippocampal neuron uh, neuron at soft therapeutic concentration, even low dose. For mood stabilizer, we use high dose. Even low dose lithium is helpful. It was reported 150 mg per day or less than. Article 2022, 2020. Again, uh, it is also helpful on the uh, dementia. So, scope of lithium on future post head injury, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, spinal cord injury, anti suicidal adhesion, any neurogenerative disorder. So what are the advantages of lithium over sodium valvate? It is said that lithium is the gold um, standard mood stabilizer. And while you cheap, even uh, severe liver, liver disease, it is advantage over sodium valvate and uh, caramazine. Uh, woman with the menstrual irregularities, polycystic ovary, and other very important thing is it is 
cheap, three times cheap than sodium valproate, more effective than other mood stabilizer, uh, it, uh, best for suicidal thought patient, resistant depression, and many neurological disorders. So how, before starting lesson, what are the, we should take precaution. <coughs> so very important thing is, basic test, thyroid function test, renal function test is more important. You start with 750 to 900 mg per day, do blood test after five to seven days, because for steady state level, blood level. And uh, blood samples will be taken 12 hours before, uh, after the last dose. Therapeutic level 0.5 to 1.2, 0.6 to 1.2, and maintenance level is 0.5 to 1 for mood uh, <coughs> disorder. Contraindication of lithium, lithium is sometimes danger drug, so if there is clear cardiac uh, problems, renal problem, thyroid problem, neurological disorder, presence of blood, dyscrasis, pregnancy, and poor response of lithium are BPAD mix, bipolar mix, poor response, rapid cycling, also poor response, hypothyroidism, and uh, bipolar with psychoactive substance. It is poor response as compared to sodium valproate or carbamazepine. Lithium and ECT, so lithium, we know lithium has narrow therapeutic window, so we should hold ECT while uh, we, uh, we should hold lithium while we are uh, doing ECT. The very important things uh, initiating the uh, and maintaining the lithium patient, we should tell the patient, uh, patient, clearly tell that lithium is dangerous drug, it is cheap drug. So if there is diarrhea, vomiting, we should hold lithium at that day. We have patient, South Asia, patient comes uh, with bipolar disorder and uh, single prescription, patient take long time, repeated. Sometimes after five years, patient comes. So chance of lithium toxicity is high on that situation. And renal function test, thyroid function test, serum calcium level also very, very important. So certain drug, other drugs like NSAID, uh, also we should take precaution about uh, will patient is taking lithium. Side effects, there are so many side effects, but some side effects are more danger and some are less danger. Indocrine uh, side effect, hypothyroidism, we should take special precaution. Renal side effect also we should take uh, precaution. Hematological, cardiovascular, normal, so many side effects and terror effects, so we should Lithium is contraindicated during pregnancy. So it causes immistant anomaly. So here are cost of mood stabilizer on Nepali rupees. Uh, lithium, lithocade 300, uh, one tablet, 300 mg tablet, 3.5 rupees, Nepal rupees. So all these like that. Sodium alpha is more costly. About three times more costly than li lithium. And lithium is even cheaper than caramel. So what are the take home message? Lithium is cheap, effective, and widely used mood stabilizer. It is dangerous drug, need to take special precaution while using it. Lithium toxicity is life-threatening, need to manage immediately. Lithium is <coughs> drug which reduces suicide. <coughs> L 
Lithium also has neuropotentive and neurotrophic <coughs> function which preserve the brain, particularly gray and white matter, while using long time. Lithium usefulness is under research in neurological disorder. Uh, patient taking lithium should give printed instruction. Sit, if possible. If not, possi uh, not that, then we should do counseling about the side effects. And toxicity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Professor, Professor Chandra Prashad Sadeen sir for his insightful presentation. Now our second speaker, Professor Abdullah Al Mamun Hussein sir. Professor Abdullah Al Mamun Hussein is the former head of development of psychiatry at Rajshahi Medical College and at present a practicing psychiatrist at Rajshahi Bangladesh. Now I would like to request Professor Abdullah Al Mamun Hussein sir to come to the dais and start his presentation. Well, uh, I'm very much sure that I'm not going to talk on psychiatry proper, like the schizophrenia, like the bipolar disorder. That is far, far from the psychiatry. But I do believe that nothing human is aligned to psychiatry. Psychiatry can accommodate any of the things concerning human. And you know that we have some condition they become the focus of the clinical attention. So in that respect, I picked up the gird to speak on the issues, the loneliness. As I was going through the literature, I found that until 18th century, people hardly talks about the loneliness. In most of the literature, we didn't find the very word loneliness. But as the pace of human civility was progressing in such a manner, we have been enlightened. And along with the enlightenment, there was much the birth of alienation, and which leads to the concepts of the loneliness. And to many scholars, it appears to be the huge, great maladies of the human civilization. And they even talk that it is going to be the biggest disease of the loneliness. Honorable chairs, doyens of psychiatry from different parts of the globe, learning colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. So here I have in mind to talk on some of the, it may be known or little talks, concepts of this loneliness. You will be remembering the two Mother Teresa. It was the leprosy of the modern world. And to Dr. Bibek Murthy, you will be remembering that he was the US Surgeon General in 2017. To him, of course it is an epidemic. It shortens lifespan. And just like similar to smoking 15 seeker, so why I am talking on the loneliness? Is it only a Western phenomena that I'm talking over emphasizing it? You'll be believing that in our clinical scenario, many of the young adults, they are just coming with the symptoms of the loneliness. Of course, loneliness is a key symptoms of the psychiatry. 
and as a psychiatrist we try to reach the diagnosis just considering the diagnostic criteria which has been proposed in our diagnostic bibles but it so happened that many of the peoples that could not be matched with the diagnostic topa so that gives a hunch to me whether i could talk on the issues of the loneliness and we'll be seeing that the master minds of the sakatri especially girl gustav jung he was searching the meaning of the loneliness and to him it doesn't come from having no people around but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible if we look into the global world our existing belief is that possibly mostly the older peoples are the lonely but the scenario is just taking a changes uh, you can see that in most of the data the lonely groups are going to the young peoples 70% teenagers lonely it was an american study and 2018 it was a very famous study by the bbc that was a survey and they found that more than one third people especially young generation they are experiencing the symptoms of the loneliness in europe and of course in canada about one third and one third patients uh, one third people especially they are having the solo household so you can see that this this was the experiment and you can see that um, 40% people who just belonged into the age limit of 16 to 24 years and only 27% they are more than 75 years old so it leads to the birth of the loneliness and the history and the social scientists considered that the britain and the berlin has become the capitals of the loneliness if we go on further elaborations you can see that one of the uk census you will find that about 42% women they were fear of loneliness which was more than the cancer in one in four canadians they were not satisfied with the number of the friends and it becomes more evident after the covid-19 because of covid-19 you know that uh, as regards with the communications mostly we depend on the webinars and which led to the zoom fatigue and the date of huge date of near and loved ones which takes place in different parts of the globe i found two study in bangladesh one is among the elder peoples in the sabab district of bangladesh meherpur we found that about 54.3 percent people there they were having the loneliness and among the university students about the 43 percent and this was carried is 2019 so to me loneliness appears as human conditions and when it talks about the loneliness of course the very concepts of the attachment comes forward as you remember that when the loneliness is very much ingrained with the understanding of the con of the attachment because secure attachment so for the john bolby we can quote that that is a very prelude for healthy development but you will be seeing that great numbers of the babies around the globe they are born outside of the marriage then how you are going to ensure the secure attachments of these babies which may not be the the right uh, bringing up of the skill now we can see this uh, you can see that among the europe uh, the greater persons of the babies which are born out of the marriage that is in the france you see about 60% and at the most in the greece it is about 11% in america you will find there's around 40% child they are just born out of the marriage and once again my humble appeal is that how you were going to ensure the very secure attachment of the babies so that actually causing the sudden pandemic of the social isolation and i must say that this is not the scenario of the uk and usa the same things as being prevalent among the brazil among the india and among the saudi arabia is taking place one of the important parts the loneliness which is being experienced in the japan i must say 
that how lonely people suffer, what the great pangs of separation, what the internal breathing takes place within the silent heart of the lonely man. I quote from the Haraki Murakami, his Japanese novelist, to him, loneliness sifts down inside your body, like a red wine stain on a pastel carpet. The main strain might fade a bit over time, but it will remain as a stain until they draw your final breath in. So when he talks about the loneliness considered in Japan, two terminology comes forward. One is hikikomori, that to find the people they shut up from others, and the kodokushi, especially among the elder generation, they embrace as they very lonely. You see this hikikomori, this is the terminology which was coined by Dr. Tamaki Saito, he was a Japanese psychiatrist, and he appealed to DSM-5 that whether it could be taken in the as a Japanese culture bound syndrome. So do you believe that only this hikikomori present in Japan? A study shows that even it can be prevailing even in India. You can see these pictures that the bright young man just aloof from the society, aloof from everybody's activities, just keeping himself within his rooms. So this is another part of the Kodokushi which I just told that the peoples, elderly peoples, they are just dying alone. So what happened? How to overcome this loneliness? In Japan, there was a huge birth of the booming rent frame industry. The peoples are hiring friends. They are the fake friends and fake family. This way they are trying to overcome the lanes. And here the justifies of the rent frame industry, which is booming in Japan. As I talk about the biography of the loneliness, I talk that until 18th century, it was not, not much prevalent. But so far, the civility was progressing by the end of the uh, 20th century. We find that in most of the literature, they're trying to understand the concept of the loneliness. And if you look back in the early mythology of the Bible, the loneliness was found among the Adam, Joseph, Moses, and Jesus. And you'd be believing that the Adam's loneliness, when Lord God said, it is no good that the man should be alone. We can further elaborate the earliest epic, which is the Gilgamesh, where also the concept of the loneliness depicted. And as I talked about, that enlightenment is a key factor causing the alienation. And two of the seminal work that was done in 1950 and 1978, we find that David Raisman, uh, and in 1973, R.S. Waze, they made important publications. One is the Lonely Crowd. And this is the scale, 1973, they have proposed, that is the University of California, Los Angeles. They are promoting a scale. With this, we can measure the loneliness scale. And of course, if you look into the Indian civilical history, we find that in the Ramayana, exile of Ram actually reflects some sort of loneliness. If we think about the philosophically, we have the two schools of thought, so far the loneliness has been concerned. One is the American schools, that is the headed by Henry David Thoreau. You remember, he was very much optimistic. To him, loneliness was a journey to solitude. It was a, uh, for some sort of a spiritual achievement. So he could take it as a very optimistically. But if you think about the European groups, especially after the Second World War, especially after the Holocaust, the miseries, the sufferings, the massacres, the atrocities that took place in the human civilization, that was a real question, is it worth to live in Europe? And especially if you think about the Nietzsche, to him the worth of a man is measured by the amount of loneliness that he can withstand. And you'll be believing to our surprise. Professor Abzal Zaved is not here. I think you could bear me out. And these are the two ministers. I remember the first is the minister for the loneliness. It was a earlier minister, Tracy Crowes, and the gentleman is the present loneliness minister. 
government is trying to employ the employment minister. In, even in the Japan, they have also the ministry of the loneliness. But what happened? In spite of hiring this, uh, this uh, minister, ministry for the loneliness, we find that loneliness is prevailing. Now, how we consider loneliness? We have found that many of the young people, they do not use the very word lonely, but the word certain that connotes with some sort of anxiety, fear, shame, and helplessness. So as you work in knowledge, we can see that this is a stage of distress and discomfort, while there is a gap between our desire for social connection and actual experience of it. Some of the authors, they do believe that there is some sort of heritability, about 45 to 50 percent. As you know that oxytocin uh, appears to be the happy hormone, so these hormone receptors may be reduced in case that. Now, as he talks about the loneliness, of course, another word come forward, and that is the search of the solitude. Solitude is the optimistic thought, because here the lonely people, they have the glory to be alone. They have earned the joy of being alone. But the lonely people, they have the pain of being alone. So we need to differentiate both things. As I talks about the attachment, if you remember the bold being, intimate attachment to other human beings at the heart, around which a person's life revolves. From this intimate attachment, a person draws a strength and enjoyment of life. If we go for the categorization, you can think that many types of the loneliness, I think, whole house will believe with me, sometimes with the shorter period, sometimes it with the changing circumstances, sometimes it is persistence or either social loneliness, and of course the emotional loneliness, and lastly on the questions of the existentialism, because is it worth to leave? And what happened, most people talk like that. Well, I have nobody to talk to. I have a feeling disconnected from the world. I have a feeling left out. I have a feeling of sad days, and I feel that I'm not being understood. So these are the common causes of loneliness, Losing of love, strays, anxiety, depression, memory loss, even some sort of isolation takes place after a major surgery, substance abuses, and the impairment of the hearing and the visual pattern. These are the situational causes, I think you believe. The retirement, when you move from the newer residence, this is very important because environmental psychologists, they say that every space has some sort of poetics. The poetics of space sometimes hindered, interfered, just by changing the environment. So burden of taking care also. Uh, and as a psychiatrist, I must say that when somebody comes with the loneliness, of course we try to connote whether it is a preamble with the diagnosis of the, uh, this is the schizophrenia or the depression or the metodiagnosis. You'll be seeing that British Medical Journal in February 2022, they had a proposition that we need a public health approach to the loneliness. And this is the scale we can use. It is if it is more than 20, we think that somebody is having the loneliness. And depending on the severity, 20, 25, and 35. So not only it is affecting the mental health. Of course, it is affecting the physical health because that makes inactive. And this is a vicious circle of obesity, smoking, and the high risk of the heart disease, strokes, and of course, sometimes lead to depression. As because if you consider the neurobiology, we can see that associated with all of the structures associated with our emotions, visual cortex, amygdala, alterations of the some uh, neurotrophy, especially the neurotransmitters, BDNF, changes in the high age axis and even the immunological function. And you'll be seeing that the prefrontal cortex and amygdala, the neurobiologists, they actually are suggesting the reduced volume. And even the guard brain axis, if you consider, if there is lesser microbial diversity in the guard, that causes increased loneliness. And increased loneliness actually lessens the wisdom so when we talk about the loneliness, it is not the domains of the psychiatrist always. 
it has become a social connotation it has become the philosophical connotation and in the age of the globalization the issues comes forward like the society of the capitalism and individualism we are living in the era when we have war of every man against every man we have competition in individualism and that has become the religion of a time we have the generations just working in information highway we are the internets but interconnected loners causing the birth of the technological personality we have so many friends but the friends are digitized we have so many friends but these friends are the electronic friends i have thousands of friends just traveling in the cloud but hardly i know the art and science of dealing with the man with the friend who had the real blood and flesh and of course if we talk about the migration homelessness this is another causes of loneliness you know that globally every minute 25 people are just made to displace from their country of origin forceful displacement takes place around the globe and of course lgbt issue the mcdonaldization of the society the coca cola when the tv remote authority and once again we have the friends electronic friends we have so many information but we do not know that information is not knowledge and of course we do not know that knowledgeable man has the right to wisdom to understand so this loneliness prevails everywhere and we are thinking that we are fear of missing out knowledge doesn't mean that information doesn't mean that i have the real the knowledge it may be misinformation disinformations bad information so the loneliness actually prevailing everywhere and it affects our self esteem our body images even then and in europe special that leads to the birth of the eating disorder mostly and mostly that the sexual activities done by the lonely people is a very different way and they are thinking this is the loneliest loneliness because they are using the erotic technological aid virtual intercourse with the real people so what happened ultimately among the crowd among so many people i become a lonely crowd the crowd has become so lonely and it is also prevailing among the children you can see that so when the loneliness is found among the children of course we first we take notice whether it is a physiological one whether it is a normal shyness whether it is attachment difficulty whether the school itself is a lonely place or not whether there is a divisions among the peer group relationship teaching a learning capable see and here the lonely child just moving along that and to our surprise the loneliest people actually the writers this is the hemming way you remember he was a nobel laureate but he committed suicide it is to suggest that he may be bipolar disorder anosco he was a playwright to him a writer never has a vacation for a life writer life consists of either writing or thinking of writing hemming we believe that when i go for writing actually i'm writing my bleed i'm just bleeding on my typewriter so to live alone is the fate of all great souls now how to cope up actually we need to overcome the loneliness we must admit that we are lonely positive affirmations we need to share we need to ask for what we need focus on what makes us happy consider the paid and adopt a healthy lifestyle support group if you remember the positive psychologist the father of martin selisman just remember this five words parma that is the positive emotion engagement positive relationship meaning accomplishment and i must say that never all this advice is go where the fish all because loneliness is a multifaceted job many issues come forward the political the technology even the loneliness in marriage and intimate relationships and the philosophy so what happened we need to restructure our thought processes and only then like david thoreau it appears as a joy of solitude only then it becomes a gift and i must say lastly yes 
we are alone but we should not feel lonely because solitude is a catalyst for innovation because the solitude we found our answer and we can listen to heart so i must say when somebody has the experience of lonely let us admit it and we must think that this is a warning sign we must nourish solitude let loneliness as such become a way of life let us speak loneliness let's overcome loneliness together and only then i must say that it becomes a gift for the banas to believe very humbly i do appeal do not feel lonely entire university is inside you thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you very much Professor Abdullah Al Mamun Hussain sir for his nice and elaborate presentation on loneliness as we don't have any question we are now moving to our chairperson first of all i would like to request nirmal lamachane sir to give his valuable opinion regarding today's presentation sir sir professor dr nirmal lamachane sir please give your valuable opinion regarding today's presentation uh, sir, thank you sir hello no questions taken no we don't have any questions sir okay um, regarding, regarding professor uh, cp sadai sir i remember yesterday i introduced myself as a student of mental health and i now know how much i do not know about mental health I am confused at this point whether the doctor's conviction faith in the medicine and treatment and the patient's belief and faith in the doctor that works or the medicine per se works so to the young psychiatrist I would suggest I don't know I am if I am entirely right or wrong do not write any medicine unless you are convinced one incident I remember one far when pharma people came to me and asked sir which medicine do you prefer which molecule do you prefer I answered to them I prefer not to write any molecule to my patient. I don't know how they felt. We must be grateful that they have sponsored the help us in our academic endeavors. But still and regarding the statistics I remember one saying statistics is a science of the stupid. in one of the study that we did in nepal that we did in nepal among the patient with full remission on lithium bipolar patient in full remission on lithium the therapeutic level was less than 0.6 that the literature of the west shows so i think we as a a developing country of, of different culture we should redefine and refine statistics in our population so statistics is to be taken with a pinch of salt professor mamur hussain thank you sir for excellent presentation i wish you were there in my presentation yesterday regarding life and happiness i would like to correct one of your statement where you said i am not talking about psychiatry sir you are very much talking about psychiatry and you have proven it in your presentation as well by showing different neuro neuro um, biological correlates so i think you should correct that statement 
And I believe what we teach in MD, FCPS, or whatever we study to become a psychiatrist is only 10% of what psychiatry actually is. 10 or plus minus, you can add. It is unfortunate that that is what gets us through in becoming the psychiatrist. So to young psychiatrists, I would say you are in a field with immense potential. Now it's entirely up to you whether you want to coin your name in the history or fill your pocket with coins. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nirmal Nimachare sir. Now I am requesting our respected teacher, Professor Dr. Faru Kalam sir, to give his valuable opinion regarding the presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nadia Pros. Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, lithium is a very old drug in psychiatry, but still we are struggling to know its mechanism of action. Uh, we can say this is also a magic drug in psychiatry. It can be used in a lot of conditions in psychiatry. Even people, those who are angry, those who are violent, those who are aggressive, we, we may prescribe, we prescribe lithium carbonate. So it works in different ways. Uh, we are very well known about its toxicity and we are afraid of this. We, uh, uh, frequently we encounter patients with lithium toxicity and they go to dialysis also. And I have seen also two patients die. So we are afraid of this, and young psychiatrists, they are very afraid of lithium. But this is a very young, uh, a very important drug in psychiatry. Uh, Professor P.C. Sadain, he has given some, uh, some positive information, good news, that, that it can be used in a structural degenerative change, a structural change in uh, uh, psychiatry also. Uh, he has mentioned the brain-derived neuro neurotrophic factor, this is very important. And he has say, said that the lithium increases the uh, bulk of the structures of the brain. So these are very important. Promising talks he has given us. So this is very important. And the, though this needs uh, researches to confirm, I think when people come, uh, elderly people come to us uh, with bipolar disorder, we are afraid of giving lithium because of different problems in his body, especially the kidney function. But as this drugs is likely to increase the brain structures and works to BDNF, I think we can prescribe also lithium in case of elderly patients with bipolar disorders. Uh, here, if we give the sodium belfort and other drugs, the patient becomes confused, drowsiness, and sometimes falls. So this may be a good uh, option for us. Uh, Minister for Loneliness in UK, I think this issue, this post highlights the uh, importance of the topic that has been presented by Professor uh, Mamun Hussain. He's a great literator in Bangladesh, uh, Bangla Academy Law uh, Awardee, and other awards he has uh, uh, he achieved in Bangladesh. So he always talks about the minds of the people. Uh, what loneliness causes? Loneliness causes uh, some anxiety and depression, and that anxiety and depression leads to the stress hormones in the body and that ultimately decreases the immunity of the body. That leads to lots of physical and mental disorders and ultimately the lifespan of the uh, individual gets decreased. So this is very important. Uh, one, important thing, one important thing he has mentioned that uh, we are all, uh, we may be lonely among people also. When we are with friends, when we are in social activities, we feel we are not lonely. But he has said that we may be lonely among people also. There are lots, th thousands of people, but I may be uh, lonely. I think it is unwise to, be, uh, mo uh, unwise to be more intelligent, because intelligent people usually have less friends. There is a gap between the intelligent people and general people. So when you are more intelligent, your intelligence level doesn't match with the intelligence level of the general people. So it is unwise to be to try to be more intelligent. It is try to it is better to try to be general people, and that will give you lots of friends, and you will not be lonely. Uh, renting friend, uh, is it possible? I think this is a very new concept, and uh, so we think about this because if we do not have friends, it's likely we will be uh, lonely, and we will have lots of friends. Social activities, friends, and positive way of thinking. What Dr. Mamun has. Uh, tried to uh, 
inform us that positive thinking is very important. Not only having friends, so social activities, friends is very much important in uh, in, in this uh, issues. Uh, adda in Bangla we say adda, gossiping, golfagara, adda mara. If we go to the age of Socrates and Aristotle, they did not have any laboratories. They did not have any scientific activities. What they used to do, they yeah, they used to do morning session in their chambers, in their house. And people used to come from distant areas to their chamber. And they are now very known people in this world, Socrates, Aristotle. They, they did nothing. They only arranged adda, gossipings. And now they are great philosophers. So adda is very important thing. I, I think those who, who, those who are not accustomed to gossiping, they are at risk of having loneliness and ultimately they may develop the idea of suicide. So this is very important. Thank you both speakers. We had three speakers. We missed one and the two speakers, they are very learned and their presentation are very nice and we enjoyed and we have been benefited also. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. Now this is time to give crest of appreciation to our speaker. First of all, I would like to come Professor Chandra Prakash Sedensar to the dais to take his crest of appreciation from Professor Nirmal Lamichane, sir. Please, sir, come on the dais. Our second speaker, Professor Abdullah Al Mamun Hussein Sir, will take his crest of appreciation from our respected teacher, Professor Dr. Farooq Alam Sir. Please, sir, come on the dais. Now it is, uh, we'll move to the next session. We will now uh, giving our crest of appreciation to our chairperson. First of all, I would like to request Professor Brigadier General M. Kamrul Hassan Sir, who is the advisor and head of department of psychiatry, CMH Dhaka. Please, sir, come on the dais and deliver the crest of appreciation to our chairperson, sir. First of all, Farooq Alam Sir will take his Chairperson Crest of Appreciation from Brigadier General Kamrul Hassan sir. Please sir come on the dais and deliver the Crest of Appreciation to our Chairperson. Our second Chairperson, Professor Nirmal Namichane will take Crest of Appreciation from our respected teacher, Professor M. Mohit Kamal sir. Sir. Our chairperson is taking his crest of appreciation from our respected teacher, Muit Kamal, sir. Now ending of the session, thank you everyone for your patience hearing and very good day. This session is sponsored by Sun Pharma. Thank you everyone. Now it is time for tea break for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And poster presentation will be held after the tea break. During the tea break. Sir. 